Biologists say that placental mammals all evolved from some tree shrew-like organism who lived about 65 million years ago. But modern tree shrews would never say that. Supremely conscious of all the ways that their lineage has evolved and gotten better over the past 65 million years, and completely oblivious to all the ways that other lineages have evolved over the same 65 million year period, modern tree shrews would say that that placental mammals evolved from some human-like organism who lived about 65 million years ago. And modern tree shrews interested in life on other planets might say, because of their primitive features, human-like organisms are probably more common on other planets than tree shrews. Go figure. <laughs> Let's talk about the diversity of life on Earth and how it compa might compare to the diversity of life in the universe. So here's the universe. It starts with the Big Bang and hydrogen and helium make stars. The stars make some planets. On Earth, life got started and then it has evolved in these various directions. And here we are, the animals, and we're a tiny branch here and we think we're complicated. Now, so there's cosmic evolution started with astronomy and produced life on Earth. But there also might be places where you start out the same way in astronomy and then you do not get life. You get no life on a planet like the Earth. So when we look at a star field like this, each little dot is a star. Maybe the sun is over here and there's the Earth and the Earth has life on it. And maybe there are some other planets with life, there they are, and there's some that don't have life like this. And so we can illustrate, modify this diagram to make it look like this. There's no life here, there's life on this planet, life on that planet, no life on that planet. Um, that's one way of thinking about it. Now, I've asked a lot of scientists what they thought about the kind of life elsewhere. And most scientists think that in the universe, simple microbial life will be common and that complex intelligent life like us will be rare. That seems to be the most common opinion of scientists. Now, the reason we, some people think that is because when you look at bacteria, they're morphologically simple. This is a bunch of E. coli, and they just look like elongated blobs. And if you look at, here's a eukaryote, a morphologically complex eukaryote. It's an anglerfish with jaws and eyeballs and ears and all kinds of crazy things. But, you know, there are exceptions to this, important exceptions. So here's a Petri dish of prokaryotes living together and they form all kinds of beautiful patterns here. That looks really complicated to me. And here's the morphological complexity of a, of a tree leaf, for example. So I don't see any necessarily difference between these and these. But again, we're comparing one organism to a whole bunch of supposedly individual prokaryotic cells. Now, you will hear that prokaryotes like this are supposed to be simple and eukaryotes are supposed to be complicated, but I don't buy it because these eukaryotes are really just a bunch of prokaryotes that have gotten together. So we can say that eukaryotic complexity and prokaryotic complexity are not mutually exclusive because eukaryotes are made out of prokaryotes. So when scientists say this thing about simple microbial life will be common and complex intelligent life will be rare, they're thinking of the following thing. Let's, let's ask ourselves this question. They're, they're saying that in this beautiful tree of all life on Earth, all of this kind of life will be common and down here where we live, it will be rare. But all the organisms at the tips of the branches have evolved for the same amount of time, about four billion years, in this tree. Might they all be equally complex and equally rare? I think we recognize and value our own morphological complexity while systematically ignoring the many kinds of microbial complexity. I think simple microbial life only exists if we ignore all of the complexities that have evolved in microbes over the past four billion years. And I think most of the scientists I talked to were non-microbiologists. And so, yes, they systematically ignore the complexities of microbiology. So 
I think if microbes have evolved as much as we have, then we shouldn't expect microbes in all their complexity to be common in the universe. So I think that uh, most of these scientists don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and so maybe it's the case that everything that's on the tips of these branches, these extant organisms, are rare, but at the root, maybe those types of organisms are common. They're bacteria-like, but not the same thing as the bacteria that have evolved after four billion years of evolution. So, in this diagram that we showed earlier, maybe it's the case that all life that has evolved for a few billion years diversifies, becomes quirky, and by comparing with other life elsewhere, is, qu is quirky and rare. Now, there's another way of looking at diversity, and that is as a circle. So here's the circle. If we draw a circle on this plot, we can say 95% ah, of that circle is prokaryotic, made from archaea and bacteria, and about 5% are eukaryotes. Now, here's another diagram, pretty much the same thing, but it shows the opposite. It's not that 5% are eukaryotes, it's 95% of the diagram on the right are eukaryotes, and only 5% are the archaea and bacteria. So it's just the opposite. They're really showing two different things. And the, the lesson here is that depending on who's making the plot will determine who gets most of the diversity, who gets most of that 360 degrees of the circle. Here's another plot, 98% are eukaryotes. This person loves eukaryotes, and they know nothing or don't like bacteria and archaea, so they only give them 2% of the diversity. It shows you how subjective this is, so be careful. Here's one in which 90% of the diversity is bacterial and archaeal, and 10% is eukaryotic. So, let's imagine that we can just uh, generalize and say that all the diversity of life on Earth is in that green circle green oval, and then in this larger diversity of life on Earth is in the blue. It's a much larger diversity. Now, we are not familiar with all the diversity of life on Earth. We'd like to become more familiar. We'd like to get more in knowledge, and actually we'd like to know all the diversity of life on Earth, because when we do that, then we can make educated guesses about the kinds of diversity that might exist among the life elsewhere in the universe. So let's, let's play a little game here. Let's do another diagram. Let's suppose that the blue is the diversity of all life in the universe. We don't know how big it is, but we're going to assume that it's much, much bigger than life on Earth. And in the center, we have the origins of life, and we have planets in which originated, had life that originated, and then diversified and took its share of the blue. And there are other planets that life evolved from the middle, and it also has diversified. And there are other planets. And then we have the Earth as one of those other planets. And all the diversity of life on Earth is a small subset of the diversity of life in the universe, kind of like what we showed in the previous diagram. The diversity of life on Earth is a small subset of the diversity of life in the universe. So they're just two different ways of representing this comparison between the Earth and the rest of the diversity of life in the universe. Now, we also want to know about what kind of diversity is nearby. That's why we're doing this thing. We want to figure out how is the diversity elsewhere in the universe. But we can make another diagram, and this is kind of stretching a little bit. Let's imagine that we can make the full circle is all possible diversity, not just all the life that exists, but all possible diversity that will ever exist or ever has existed. And then we have planets and we have the diversity of life in the universe is the blue. So the diversity of life in the universe is only a small, section, small subset of all possible diversity. And then we have Earth being, of course, a small subset of the diversity in the universe, an even smaller subset of all possible diversity. And this is kind of a weird example of, of trying to understand, put these the, these three sets of diversity, all possible in the universe and on life, in, on Earth. And so there are other planets. Now, how will those other planets, if they form life, how will they fill out this diagram? One way they could fill it out is 
they, they increase the diversity of life in the universe. When there's new life on another planet, it increases the diversity of life in the universe in, and gets bigger and bigger. On the other hand, there's another way. Maybe the diversity in the universe is so large already that when we get a new planet with new life, it just kind of fills in right there, fills in the diversity without getting much more, fill, without filling in much more of the, the possible diversity. And maybe that's really, really hard to get the other types of diversity. Anyway, these are ways to summarize and ways to think about the diversity of life in the universe that may help us understand how the diversity of life on Earth relates to the diversity of life in the universe and, even larger, all possible diversity. All possible diversity. We don't know how big that is. If it's infinite, then billions and billions of planets with billions and billions of life forms, including the Earth and all its millions and millions of species, would occupy a negligible fraction of that diversity. In fact, a fraction equivalent to zero, because if the number of species is n, and we divide that by infinity, it's equal to zero. All possible diversity.